Nowhere in all America will you find more patrician-like houses, parks and gardens more opulent than in New Bedford. All these brave houses and flowery gardens. Herman Melville, Moby Dick. Whaling in the early 1800s, it was a dangerous business. Whale oil for lighting lamps and lubricating machinery was the lifeblood of the global economy, just as crude oil is today. And so, for many in the whaling industry, the chance to make a fortune was worth the risk. Among New England's wealthiest whaling merchants was an industrious Quaker named William Roach, Jr. Originally from Nantucket, Roach re-established his family's whaling operation on the shores of the Acushnet River. There, his business thrived and helped build what was for many years America's wealthiest per capita city, New Bedford. As the whaling capital of the world, New Bedford launched ships to destinations all over the globe. In turn, the city attracted a diversity of people from foreign lands. William Roach's first New Bedford residence, pictured here to the left in this painting, was located close to the harbor. The building is now the Mariner's Home on Johnny Cake Hill. In 1834, on land he inherited from his father, he built this Greek Revival mansion and joined the whaling elite of County Street, high above the clatter and smells of the busy waterfront. What is most unique about this national landmark is its authenticity. A portal to the past, it is New England's only whaling mansion on its original grounds that is open to the public. Although the families who lived here were titans of the local business economy, this was a real home. People were born here, they married here, and they died here. The laughter of children rang through the halls, as did the celebrations of high society. We welcome you to step back in time and experience the remarkable lives of the people who lived here during a period of 147 years in a community closely tied to the sea. The Roaches were to whaling what Andrew Carnegie and John D. Rockefeller were to steel and oil. Joseph Lawrence McDevitt, Jr., historian. William Roach, Jr.'s renowned entrepreneurial successes extended well beyond the community of New Bedford into national and international arenas. For example, the Roach family owned the only whaling company that could supply the United States government with enough whale oil to operate its lighthouses. Beyond the economic realm, his Quaker ethics, social stature, and civic activism had a profound and lasting impact on the community. The open secret of his success is the untiring devotion he gave to his business. Obituary of Edward C. Jones After William Roach Jr. died, another Nantucket transplant, Edward Coffin Jones, purchased the house in 1850 for $17,000. He lived here for 30 years. A widower with three daughters, Jones was an immensely successful whaling agent. Of all the people who lived in the house, Edward Jones amassed the greatest fortune, an estate that was worth more than one and a half million dollars in 1850. Upon his death, his daughter Amelia, who lived in the house for 84 years, inherited the property. Amelia's love of the arts and expansive philanthropy endeared her to the community. Amelia was held in great esteem by her many nieces and nephews who cherished their visits to the house. Her great-nephew, Stephen Forbes, reminisced about visiting Auntie Joan's house on Thanksgiving. He recalled listening to Amelia's music box, sliding down the banister, and gazing upon the Thanksgiving table laden with food and a centerpiece of exotic fruits. Today, the first floor furnishings and artwork reflect the time frame of the Jones residency. The art includes the recently restored masterpiece, The Carpenter's Son by Edward Emerson Simmons. If the direction of the city's advance was under discussion, 
it was inevitable that someone would say, See what Mark thinks about it. Editorial, New Bedford Standard Times. The maritime legacy continued at the house when Mark M. Duff, whose family business initially provided whaling transport, purchased the home in 1935. Mr. Duff's illustrious career included the presidency of the city's most powerful bank, head of the Republican Committee, and CEO of the New Bedford Hotel. The Duffs redecorated the house extensively before moving in. The decor of Mrs. Duff's bedroom reflects the family's attention to detail and choice of traditional interior design, which fit their more formal lifestyle. After Mark Duff's death in 1967, Mrs. Duff lived here through the late 1970s. In 1981, New Bedford's Waterfront Historic Area League saved the house from commercial development and it became a museum. While this house reflects the enormous wealth generated by whaling, it abuts the city's earliest working class neighborhood. The house and its history link these cultures and reflect the changes in workforce over time. For example, the Jones family employed Norwegian, Irish, Scottish, Portuguese, Cape Verdean, and African American working class immigrants, as well as an escaped slave from the American South. All three families who lived here had a passion for gardening and horticulture. William Roach was a member of the New Bedford Horticultural Society and well known for growing fine pears, similar to this St. Michael's pear painted by his nephew. Both William Roach and Amelia Jones engaged gardeners and grew a variety of roses. For the Duffs, the gardens were an extension of the formality and showiness of their interiors. Today, the gardens have been revitalized, and the Roach Jones Duff House is a living museum where both children and adults actively participate in exciting historical and horticultural programs. <laughs> this national landmark offers links to the past, connections to the present, and inspiration for tomorrow. The museum chronicles important chapters in American history when this maritime community played a pivotal role in international trade, commerce, and culture. It is this proud history we embrace and share.